the past month has proven that scumbags are quite loud and the whole uh, the, the whole story is about Zoe, Zoe Queen and uh, Anita Sarkisian. It just proves to you that if you leave people unpoliced and unsupervised, other people get death threats and have to like move out of, the, out of their houses. And so maybe someone still still should police the actions of the community. Uh, certainly, the actions of the community net to have to be policed and I'm not suggesting that you should be able to put up anything you want in the Google store or in the Apple store. But the, the, where that level of restriction happens and what the implications are culturally in terms of what you have access to um, are, I think, as, as you mentioned, and, and, and this is the real limitations of the mobile world. There's basically two stores, right? And, and you basically need to access those two stores. In the console world and in the broader PC world, there are lots and lots of places for you to publish your game and ship your game. But then there's ESRB, which, well, controls most of the sales by giving ratings. I, I, I don't think the ESRB affected Minecraft in any way. I mean, that's the, you know, we go back to the conversation. There's, some, there's a company that's basically a cross-platform game, bunch of great people, very creative opportunity, very unrestricted opportunity. There are people who do a lot of terrible things with their Minecraft blocks too, right? And there are people who do a lot of really wonderful things. I, I think that's the, the, the beauty of kind of the game environment actually is, is it's always been an alternative creative expression platform. I don't mean to get into a whole discussion of this, but I think it's, it's really interesting and I think the limitations of having only two outlets in a Google store and an Apple store limit the mobile space. So uh, let's get back to happier themes like money. Money is good. Um, Sony All Ent Entertainment currently develops games which are free to play, very premium productions, free like Planet Side 2, like EverQuest Next going to be probably, um, is, but we're paying for it. We're paying with either with microtransactions or with data about us. Is data going to become more important than, uh, than money, even for AAA publishers? I don't think so. I think you're, you're, uh, the people who are collecting data without permission from the consumers are going to constantly be facing challenges from the government or government agencies around the world. And that's really not the, the advertising business, which is a $200 billion plus business, is interest, they're interested in data, but they're also interested in showing their advertisements to the consumer. So they can gather a lot of data from small sample sizes. So I don't believe the whole focus for advertisers, which is really the, the revenue engine for Facebook and Google and a lot of these companies, is, is uh, consumed with, with a huge amount of data. They need some data and they want targeting, but they're really focused on getting their ad to the right person at the right time. Not sitting there collecting uh, mounds and mounds of data and they're, they're really looking again to send their advertisements to the right person. Yeah, I, I, As a company that collects data and all of us. But I mean I largely agree like I think developers are looking they're not after data for data's sake they're after data to make their product better their advertising better their targeting better and so Facebook is very keen to share to make it very transparent what the user is sharing with a third party developer and to make that set of data as minimal as it can possibly be. And we really have clamped down on apps that ask for, you know, my girlfriend's dog's birthday, right? Like just for the sake of having it. That said, there are the companies that in kind of the, you know, Facebook gaming kind of space that do really well use data very effectively. And I mean, King has publicized that they do this stuff. They, you know, they can see when a player is going to churn and they try and cross promote into other games and they have a very good understanding of a user's behavior within their apps. And you only need to look at the kind of the explosion of analytics services and providers that show that there is this value because it drives, you know, better products ultimately. But I think that it is to that end. It is to make a better product, to target your advertising better. It's not just data for the sake of data. I, I think that what's really interesting about free to play gaming is that Ultimately, every user is paying the exact perfect price for their experience. 
but the vast majority of people are getting a free experience and the people who really care and really want to win and are really invested in the game spend money. And, and in that regard, I think it's a really, it's, it's a really beautiful economic engine because the, the, the bulk of us basically get a good game for free and the people who really care, who are, are truly invested, are spending their time and their money to get better. And this is where kind of the free-to-play mobile world and the historical MMO world really overlap. When, it, when, when we were at our peak, the average EverQuest gamer played 40 hours a week. And, so, and, they, and they were paying $15 a month, so they were spending less than 10 cents an hour for their game experience, which is just a fantastic entertainment value. Okay? And, and that was for, for people who were really invested. Today, if, if you're a free-to-play gamer and you don't really care about winning the game and evolving and, and beating and getting to level 120, okay, you can play for free for as long as you want, which is fantastic. And you're subsidized by the people who are literally spending thousands of dollars to win that game. But will we see a moment where uh, AAA games with a huge development budget, such as GTA, such as Destiny, becomes free to play from the beginning, not because it has failed as a retail product, but free to play from the beginning, calculated risk and calculated investment? I think you'll, I think you'll see it take shape similar to the, the video model, the, net, the Netflix model. You're going you're gonna to see a time in the next 12 to 18 months, some experts say, where the console experience will be equaled by the streaming experience on a television or television device. A lot, a lot of people are predicting that. So when the, the latency is uh, to a point where it's unrecognizable, you're going to see people uh, playing those uh, AAA games and streaming services, and the economics will get more attractive for the publishers as well. And when you think about it, in the U.S., you can, for $8 a month, you can view basically every TV show, virtually every movie uh, that, that's available for $8 a month. And I don't know what the model will be. You might be paying $60 for a game or $5 a month, but those AAA titles will be coming to, to game streaming services. We really believe that. Will they be coming to Facebook? No comment. Um, I, I agree with what was said about, you know, it's a great economic model because people end up paying exactly what they want to pay. I think with that said though, there is always an impact on user experience. You're always trying to monetize and upsell. And there, for the foreseeable future, at least in my eyes, there will always be room for a, a premium experience where, you know, a, a gamer pays up front for a, a, some content, be that through subscription and streaming or be it just a one-off purchase, and then they get to consume that content. It's a bit like, you can sit and watch YouTube videos all day, but sometimes you want to sit down and watch a proper movie. Well, and, and, and the models coexist in, and have coexisted in television for a long time, right? In this pay television that's got no ads, and there's an ad-supported television, and you can make a choice. And both of those economic models support a great deal of innovative content. So there's no reason why both of those economic models can't continue to coexist in the game space and, and drive content on, on the same basis. So since we're talking about the future of games, uh, each of you, the best and the worst thing to happen to this industry in the next five years, and then we'll open the floor to questions if there are any. Well, I think the, the, the best thing that's going to happen to the game business is Moore's Law, where you're going to see this rapid expansion of Wi-Fi connected devices some are predicting, I think we're at one and a half billion connected devices today that's expected to grow to three to four billion devices in the next few years. So you're just going to have, you, you know, Wi-Fi or high-speed connections just ubiquitous everywhere. And that's, that's really going to allow you to get the games you want anytime you want on any device. It's, it was sort of a slogan in the early days of, of game streaming, but it's going to become a reality. That's probably the best thing. The, the worst thing to happen is if publishers don't move fast enough and then they'll get disintermediated in, in other ways like the music business. So hopefully the publishers can be proactive and get ahead of it you know, as, they, uh, as they finally did in the music business. I can think of the best thing. I'm not sure I can think of the worst thing. 
I think the best thing is related. I think not only will connections get better, but the amount of people that have access to those connections will improve. Like Facebook is still growing. We're still onboarding, you know, users from African countries, you know, developing nations. And I think that as connectivity improves, just people's access to this experience will get grow, and that's great. Worst thing is much harder. I'm not sure. I, I think the best thing will be kind of the 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 amalgamation of the, of the platforms and the evolution of different forms of gameplay into console gaming and virtual reality gaming. Um, right now, we're still in, in an era where you see the bulk of innovation in true gameplay differential on the mobile space because people can experiment and try things there that they can't afford to do. I think hopefully um, when VR becomes cheaper and more ubiquitous and, and broadband connectivity becomes more ubiquitous, you'll see more experimentation and an evolution of, of gameplay. Questions? Hi. Um, I see a lot in common with game streaming and the film industry in that uh, in order to, well, you said that um, in the next 18 months, game streaming can compete with conventional consoles. And my question is, do you see publishers getting so open to this in order for them to allow game streaming to stream the most recent release titles? In a way, is, your statement is like saying that in days to come, DVD or, or movie streaming or series stream will make uh, cinemas obsolete or will allow TV to compete with movie theaters and cinema. So do you see publishers open to this concept of releasing straight away to digital uh, and streaming? I think they're getting close. I mean, we have AAA titles from last year. So that might be 13 or, or 14. Um, as opposed to 15. So I think they'll get there. It may evolve where instead of being part of a subscription service today that might be a $15 a month subscription service on one of the big platforms like a Roku or, or one, uh, Telecom Italia or, or one of the, the carriers around the world, you might have a subscription service and then you may pay extra for that premium game. If you want to buy Destiny on day one, the same day it's going into retail, you'll pay $60 or some special price. So I think it, it will probably, have, it, it might evolve that way, that publishers are worried that if, if people could rent games, will they not pay $60 for a game? But um, in the music business, people used to spend $12, $14 for an album, and now they only spend 99 cents. So I think they'll get, they'll get creative about that. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Hi. Uh, how do, well, we are in Israel and uh, we want some uh, PR. So where do you see the Israeli industry combined inside, inside all this future coming on? Well, Playcast, I understand. And uh, we already know Plarium and Playtica are doing the, like the top companies in the world in uh, Facebook. But uh, where are other spots in this future that we can run into? and use our uh, special genes uh, to make the best creative companies or games? Uh, question mark. I mean, I, I, I think a, a good model, actually, going back to the comment about cinema, is, you know, Israeli cinema took 30 years to become world class, right? Israeli television only took about 15 years to become world class as a function of all that talent from cinema, right? And so you look at that and you go, there's an Israeli film in consideration for an Academy Award almost every year. There's, there's no reason why that level of talent, that kind of storytelling talent, doesn't start getting involved into interactive arts as a form of expression, and you'll start to see it evolve from that. I think the real question about Israeli gaming is when people will take the Israeli experience and translate it into gameplay. 
and that will start determining what the games industry in Israel can really be. Any, any other questions from the audience? Okay, so I have a question, last question. Um, let's say I want to build up a billion dollar business or a billion dollar exit. Uh, you talked about few the, a few of them today. Uh, uh, Twitch, Minecraft, uh, the Oculus Rift. Now, they're all pretty different, but I did notice one thing in common for all of them. All of them are actually tooled for other people to create content for them. Even Minecraft, which is basically a game, it wasn't where it is today if it wouldn't let people create all the content. And here you worked at uh, you invested in Machinima, and the same story applies there, I guess. So my question is, can you actually make a billion dollar business today if you don't go in that direction? You, don't, you, you want to tell your story, you want to create your video game, you want to create your product, and it's not the type of product that lets people uh, do whatever they want inside it. Can it still be possible? I think it's, cl it's clear you can go both ways. I mean, it, there's always been attraction to the ability for a player to customize their experience. Um, I mean, this is kind of why MMOs took off, because you really are defining your own world. It's why The Sims was a hit for you know, EA for so long. Um, but then Candy Crush has no customization whatsoever, and that's a billion dollar game. So I think that there's no set formula. I think the interesting thing about Oculus was that it's a, it's a platform, and it's, or it at least could become a platform in the future, and that's what made it interesting. But I, I think that its value is wider than just the experience is customizable, basically. I think it's always dangerous when artists start off by saying, I want to create a billion dollar business, versus the, you know, the, 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 the creative energy of, of creating something that's different, that's unique, that's a, uh, potentially a fantasy experience is really what drives the creative arts. And that's not just in gameplay, but in making movies or making films. And then the business guys or gals around the room try to figure out how to monetize it. So um, I would just focus on making something that's unique and different and, and immersive and engaging and fun. And you know, I don't think that if you ask the Candy Crush founders when they got started, did they expect that the take up, they, they were making something fun and interesting and, and it took off. And that's probably the same in every creative expression. I was just quoting Justin Timberlake in The Social Network, and when he says, you know what's cool? A billion dollar, so. I think Facebook was started in a dorm room, wasn't it? Okay, another question here? Okay, there you go. Um, you've mentioned the music industry a few times, um, and the real big problem with the music industry is that the customer um, kind of lost the mentality of paying for stuff. They, they now expect to get music for free. Um, are you afraid that the same is going to happen with games at some point? I guess that's always a, a possibility. You know, I, I think the music industry was late to, uh, to embracing digital and so piracy got card. I think the video part of the industry got ahead of the game and so you have less video uh, piracy than probably music piracy and they created technologies to block video downloads faster than the music downloads. Now ironically I think the artists are making as much money now as before but they're just making it in touring and they're almost giving away the music in order to uh, create the, the concert tour. I mean if you look at the the annual income of these major artists and, and, and even the older artists like the Rolling Stones or others it's it's in the tens of millions per year so that model has just changed. They're giving away the music in exchange. Um, so in, in some ways, the Twitch model, they may be sort of giving away the gameplay to create this massive audience that they're monetizing and advertising. So it could evolve that way, but th there'll always be a way to monetize that business or it can't exist. Yeah, I also think the model is different. So music piracy, you, you download this thing and then you have this thing, right? Where increasingly, the games that are popular are connected games, connected experiences, so it's much easier to prove the legitimacy of a copy, a client that's running a certain game. And so I think that, in a way, this will kind of, it mitigates itself in the future. And I, I, as these experiences become more connected, it's harder to you know, have this kind of pirated experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.